Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Secret Podcast. You know, people have said time and time again that the podcast tends to focus more on the simple side of the puzzle, right? We don't tend to go out to the edges. Uh, Some members of the community have sort of far-reaching theories that the members of the podcast team don't necessarily agree with, and we wanted to give those members of the community their fair shake. So today, we're going to tackle probably the toughest topic in the secret to tackle, which is the back of the book. Does the back of the book contain any clues? Does the back of the book help you? Does it matter at all? We're going to try to answer that today. Uh, There's been a couple of searchers who over the years have really pushed the back of the book. One's named Carly, one's named Carlene. Their, their, Their names are sort of similar. They have sort of similar ideas. It's weird. This is a puzzle, people. Uh, so we figured we'd give them an opportunity to uh, to explain themselves. Uh, I know when you when you come across these ideas about the back of the book uh, on random you know forum posts or or posts on Facebook or posts on Reddit, it's sort of hard to wrap your mind around it, right? Because you know it's little pieces of information that's you know cut and pasted here and there, and until you get the full idea. It's hard to understand what they're talking about. So we figured an entire episode dedicated to that would be a good idea. In addition to Carly and Carlene, Bradley and I uh, are also uh, happy to welcome a guest named Seeds. Seeds uh, is has got a weird name. You know, he's a California weird surfer dude. You'll be able to tell who Seeds is. Um, Seeds doesn't have much of an opinion about this. Seeds is sort of 50-50, right? Seeds sort of thinks that there's stuff in the back of the book, but maybe there's not, and who knows. So Seeds is here as our control, right? He he doesn't have an opinion either way. He's just a cool guy who loves the secret and wants to sort of hang out and have a discussion with us. Uh, so let's get into it. Carly, um, you go first. Could you tell us a little bit about you know, how you got into this, sort of why you got into this, where you're hunting from, that sort of thing? Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, I've been I've been involved in The Secret for about, coming up on a year in September, so pretty new to it. So just been uh, into treasure hunt since about 2018, and uh, The Secret caught my eye, so I've been, been working on that uh, for about the last year. Nice. And uh, Carly, where are you hunting from? Uh, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, so that's primarily the, uh, the cask I'm after. Very, very cool. All right, we have Seeds. Um, Seeds was uh, actually at our um, our meetup in San Francisco. Oh, what um, a great time. It was a phenomenal time. Everybody thought that uh, you had um, a hairline, and you don't. You want to tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> don't be fooled by red hearings. <laughs> I'll say, man, during that meetup, everybody was walking through their ideas and stuff. Seeds was the the most fun. Like I, I agreed with Seeds until he got to the end. When he got to the end, I was just like, whoa, that's kind of weird. But until he got to the end, he had the best ideas that I had heard. And then later on, okay, completely sure. abandoned them. Like he, he doesn't. He's like, no, nope, that's totally wrong. Which sucks. Oh, it does. There's still a few. There's still a few places I like to adventure out there. Well, what's up, everybody? I'm Seeds, looking at San Francisco, around the area. Appreciate all of you and the conversations we have. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. And our lovable art. Uh, Carmen, do you teach art? Is that what you teach? I teach art, yep. Yes, our lovely art teacher, Carlene. Um, <laughs> she has always had phenomenal ideas. I love her videos on the New York puzzle. Carlene, talk about yourself a little bit. Okay, well, I'm Carlene, and everybody that knows me knows I'm really into New York, specifically Prospect Park. I am first generation expedition unknown. Um, super supportive family, lets me travel to Brooklyn all the time. Um, I've been in Manhattan a little bit too. Uh, my favorite thing about the puzzle is the friends that I've met, and um, shout out to all of them, and I'm so glad to be here. Well, we are glad to have you on. George, you haven't said anything yet. No, no, I'm saving it. I'm saving. This is gonna be fun. I'm saving it. I'm gearing up. 
<laughs> this nice. is gonna be great the, i mean the like the back of the book the, the secret back of the book is almost like revelations for the secret right people either love it or they hate it and you know i'm i'm not a doom and gloom guy so th this is gonna be a fun conversation i enjoy the back of the book i think it's entertaining do you uh, but uh yeah yeah there's some really funny things in there okay i mean i enjoy i enjoy that type of uh, fiction writing um there, there's some things that made me chuckle I mean, you either, you either, like, it's totally written by two people who wrote for, uh, who wrote for heavy metal, right? Who, who wrote from National Lampoon for heavy metal. It's written in that style and you either love it or you hate it. I mean, let's be honest. I don't know and, uh, that a lot of people read, um, heavy metal for the articles per se, kind of like <laughs> you don't get a uh, illustration or you don't get a, a subscription to Playboy for their articles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The jokes are phenomenal, but the art was always phenomenal in those um, I have um, a few copies left, actually, of heavy metal, and I just have them up for the art. They're, it's it's phenomenal. But um, let's talk about the back of the book. <laughs> I don't know, Bradley. Do you think it's phenomenal enough to talk about? Let me let me preface this one. So, Carly, for the longest time, um, you've been a really big advocate that there's been hints and clues in the back of the book, things that sort of don't necessarily lead you to the casks, but help you along the way um keywords and phrases that sort of link you to cities or to locations or you know just areas whatever just little hints when you started this puzzle what what made you think there was something in the back of the book and and what did you find that sort of solidified that the back of the book was important when i first got the book or actually started looking at it online i thought because everybody said there was nothing back there that it was just you know, kind of satirical stuff. And I really wasn't thinking much of it. And just as I began to read more and more, things started to just jump out at me that seemed to be more than just coincidence. And I could see if it was maybe one or two things, you'd be like, ah, you just kind of dismiss that. But when, when you start to see patterns and things repeating, um, you know, having been in other treasure hunts, it just, things started to, to, appear to be more than they were. And so that's when I started to really look at it uh, a lot closer. Okay. So what, what sort of patterns were you seeing? I think some of the first things I was noticing is how certain topics were coming up from different fairies. Um, you know, I've posted about this before, like the word Naga hide came up in multiple different fairies and Naga hide isn't really a, a very common word. I wouldn't even think back in the eighties, it would be, um, you know, and just, you start researching a topic like that and it takes you down you know, a little bit of a rabbit hole or whatever. And so you're trying to make some connections between what you're finding out about that subject and, and what you're researching in that fairy and, and what it could possibly tie into the, the image or the verse or whatever. But, you know, there's just a lot of little things like that. And as you start to continue from fairy to fairy, you realize that some, some are connected in ways through the immigration or the cities. Um, it could just be a word here or there. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of it is really subjective. Um, and so there's a danger in that, that, confirmation bias that could be there but um i think that's the fun of it is trying to parse that those kind of things out so as far as like naga hide not being a common word um i would that's, i would respectfully disagree with you i mean yeah, even there's even common. like comedians yeah and i mean there's always you know the joke about nagas being an animal it's like oh that poor naga died so i could have naga hide um uh, and especially, what was that? Uh, I want to say 70s when, when Naga Hyde was like super yeah. popular for furniture. Yeah, Naga Hyde was huge. So yeah. just so pe for people who don't know what Naga Hyde is, Naga Hyde is not actual leather. It's vinyl. Um, it's just it's vinyl that's made to look like leather. And it's sort of it was sort of an industry term that, that to make vinyl sound more appealing, sort of like how people threw around like Corinthian leather for a while in car interiors. People would talk about Naga Hyde in the 70s and 80s. It's just I mean, it's a better way of saying vinyl seats. You know, nobody wants vinyl seats, but Naga Hyde sounds badass. Fun fact to know and love from uh, Wikipedia, the, the creator of Naga Hyde was named Byron. <laughs> cool. I think the thing for me on that particular word that once I once I found that it was actually part of their marketing campaign that the Naga Hyde was this little fairy creature, that's when my interest really kind of kind of took a, a leap forward on that one just because like why why would he pick this word? Well maybe it's because they had a fairy creature um, and that would tie it into you know his his theme of the book. So that, that's kind of where I went with that one to, to start. Okay. 
I just, it's a trap. It's a trap that we're going to fall into in the back of the book, right? There's a lot of stuff from the eighties that because this book was written as like a, a, a commentary on not just pop culture, but culture and politics and life in the eighties. Uh, we're so far away from that now that things that would have been normal then aren't normal anymore. So they sort of stick out to us now uh, when in the eighties, they, they wouldn't so much. So it's a trap that we have to, you know, be cautious of not falling into. I agree. And I disagree with that because there are some things that, you know, like when they talk about star Wars and lightsabers, well, what is a lightsaber? You know, if you, if you take a lightsaber and you put it straight up and down, it could be a tower that lights up. I mean, we don't know. Um, but I, I agree with, with Carly on a lot of the things being repeated. I agree that there's tons and tons of images in here that have different angles and different shapes and different patterns. And, and why? Why would you do it? You know, just like people that say it doesn't matter. Well, why would you waste all that money and time publishing something that didn't matter? It doesn't make sense. I just, it's just, there's just too much. And while I think a lot of it is red herrings and some of it is probably made to be entertaining, I think... In between all of that, bits and pieces are there to help you determine between two cities. So say, for example, Dallas and Houston, because when you and I were together in Canton, we talked about that. And Houston Children's Zoo is all over those images. Yeah, but the images are completely different from the words. The images weren't made. OK, so it's important to keep in mind that that Byron's main job wasn't an editor. It wasn't a writer. It was a book packager. Byron, if you look at most of Byron's work, it's collections of other works, right? And Byron's job was to take short stories or whatever from different people, package them in a book, sell the book. Uh, and that's how the secret came to be. It was packaged. It's important to remember that the back of the book was written not by Byron. You know, it, it was right. written by Sean. But would you have thought about that in 1982? Would you have said as, you know, a 20 year old in 1982, oh, I'm not going to look at that because Byron's just a packager. You don't know that in 1982. In 1982, I would have read the book and I would have said I would have seen that it says uh, a painting and a verse leads you to a key. Like that's that's what the book says. Well, why can't it be a supplement that helps you? I mean, I guess it could be a supplement to help you, but let me turn that around and ask you the same question. Why does it have to be? Like, it doesn't have to be a supplement to help you. If Byron says it's not a supplement to help you, then it's not. And you brought up a lot of things uh, in that in that comment that we can't just gloss over. Like, art is art. Art is composed of lines. Art is composed of angles. Art is composed of patterns. It doesn't follow that just because this is a treasure hunt book that every single piece of art has to contain detailed clues. Sometimes an arm's an arm. It's not always a map. In fact, we haven't really shown that any of them are maps at all. The most that we've shown is one piece of art has a 92 train in it and a big H made out of an I beam. And that one of the pieces of art has a shuttle. Like those are very broad clues that lead you to a city. It's not like, you know, the arm of a dude has a map of pathways in, 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 in Herman Park. Like those are, those are two completely different clues. One of them we've shown, yeah, it's pretty likely. The other, not so much. I think that a couple things. One, you know, it said that Price had worked on this project for like two and a half years. And he had brought the other project members in and they worked on it a year before they even know, knew that the, the book was going to be a go. And then another year on top of that. Um, so that, that, that entire time, you know, we know from, from man and Kelly that they had their book and that he requested that they make more fairies. Um, he wanted one for each state. So that tells you right there, they had less than 50 and they ended up with over 70 of them. So, in that time, you know, he had to be giving him feedback. I mean, I think you can reasonably assume that if JJP told us that he was given clues to include in the images and the paintings, that he had no idea what they meant, but he had to put them in there, that Price could have been doing the exact same thing with his writers, just giving them a piece of information. Hey, just make sure you include this. Um, they wouldn't have known what it meant, but it would have been important to the hunt. Um, so I, I think that... That's one of the reasons why I kind of believe that there are things in the text as well. 
There's, there's one other thing, George, you brought up the fact that it says in the book that you need one verse and one painting. And I don't disagree with that at all. I think that's the way you solve these things is by using those clues um, from those two things. But I think kind of what the, the idea of the back of the book is, and this is the way I kind of look at it, the clues are in the verse and in the image, but the answer to those clues are hidden in the back. And I think that's the story of the fair folk. When, when he was interviewed for some of those newspaper articles, they even talk about how he sounded like he was the one that was entrusted to share their secrets. And so I think he took it kind of very seriously. And we know that he was forced to lie about certain things. And I always kind of looked at it like if somebody had made you promise to keep a secret for them and somebody else asked you about that, you would be forced to lie about it. You would have well, to keep that secret through lying. Okay. So, and so in, I think all the things that he's done has been towards that. In response to that, we know he's lied to people. He's never lied to the press, as far as we know. He would have no no reason to lie to the to a wider audience, right? He he lies to people who come up to him and try to get information on sort of a personal level, and he he did it before the hunt was huge. Before he knew we would be able to share those lies amongst ourselves, um, the things that he said back when the book were, was written, he he said that the back of the book has not no um, no bearing on the secret. In uh, what the Chicago Tribune, November sixteenth, nineteen eighty two. He says, uh, a description of the responsible parties, the fair people, who one learns hid all their hoard over the continent more than 300 years ago, takes up three quarters of the book, though the description is completely irrelevant to the hunt. Why would he tell the press that if, if it were untrue? Why would he lead his general audience astray? The people he's trying to get by the book during the time he's trying to get them by the book. Why would he lead them astray? That's why I have a hard time believing in the back of the book right there. All 100% of me. Yeah. For those of you that aren't 100% certain what we're referencing, just to give you some context, um, the, the field guide to the fair people starts on page 55 and ends on page 216, where it asks for you to submit your sightings of the fair people. The verses, uh, the, the actual uh, beginning of the book, including telling you that there's a puzzle, the verses and the images ends on page 54. So that's the huge amount that we're talking about as the back of the book. And that Byron did in fact say is not applicable to the actual puzzle itself. Based on what you said off, the, off that quote, number one, I don't know if it was a quote. I think it was something that the journalist wrote. And so it's impossible to know the full context of if a question was asked by the reporter and that was his response and then the reporter encapsulated it um you, you lose context in that so that, that's that's one thing uh, so and then two if you put together a project like this hold, hold on one sec yeah. if you put together a project like this and you spent two years and you had different people doing different things and you were literally the evil genius that was hiding all the clues and all this would you really want to just give it away? I mean, it's called the secret, right? Would you really want to give away the secret if if the secret is that the answers are at the back of the book? Okay. And I would say no. I would say you would definitely tell people, hey, you don't you don't need the back. Well, there's definitely a benefit for him for people to find these puzzles sooner than later. He he definitely wanted to publish a second book. Um, the the point was to have people find these, publish that they found them make money, sell books, sell a second book, make more money. So if people absolutely were not able to find these, there's no money in it for him. So I don't think he would work that hard to lead people astray. I don't think it's reasonable to assume that a journalist would lie about that, especially back then and especially in, uh, in the context of the article. You're writing an article helping an editor sell a treasure hunt book. And, and you think it's reasonable to assume that the – the author of that article would just tell people in, in a happenstance way that three quarters of the book, the book doesn't matter like that. If, if there's anything in the back of the book and the journalist were to say that in an article and it's untrue, it would destroy the entire treasure hunt. Byron would be up in arms trying to correct that, but he never did. He just let it go. It's reasonable to assume that the, the quote that's in that article is correct that Byron did say that to the journalist. So what's the definition of that though? Like, I mean, if you dissect that and not that you should or shouldn't, but like, 
yes, you need the verse. Yes, you need the image. But as I, I we were talking earlier before the before the recording, you know, for these Dallas and Houston people, why can't just a few little hints in the back let you know that it's definitely Houston and not Dallas? It's not that it's the definitive answer. It's more like, oh, P.S., this is where you really should focus. Like, does that make sense? Like, I'm not saying that it's the be all and end all. I'm just saying for several cities that are like, um, for example, is it in Brooklyn or is it in, in Manhattan? Well, if you look in the back, you can make that determination. But you are saying it's the be all end all. If you're saying that the verse leads most people to Houston, but the back of the book gives you a little hint that says, no, it's not actually Houston, it's Dallas. That's the be all end all answer of the hunt. That's the most important part. It's the part that says, hey, a lot of this verse, it's lying to you. Like it's not in Herman Park in Houston. That that quote from, from Herman Melville, that doesn't matter. It's actually in Dallas. You're saying that all the answers reside in a place where Byron himself, both in the book and in articles, said there's no answers there. Are, but we but we agree that in at least the illustrations there are clues. We all agree with that. But how far do those go? Right? You've got the Houston image with the shuttle, and then you've got the Houston image with the giant H and the 982 train, and that's obviously a clue, right? Uh, but are there like maps? And and just because we already know that Perard and that JJP and that Lloyd were working on illustrations based on information from Byron. We don't know that Sean and Ted were. So it doesn't necessarily follow that just because there are clues in the illustrations that there are in the text. I'm not going to, um, the, George, you can pull this from the podcast if you want to, but I am going to say that somebody did tell me that yes, Byron did say, make sure these words are here in this description. Kind of. He, that's what he That's what he kind of told you. What he told you was, it's odd that no one's ever taken the first part of one word, matched it with the first part of another word, and made a third completely different word. And that's fine to talk about because we've talked about it on the podcast before, but no one's ever listened because no one cares. Um, that I've always, I've said like, yeah, you can find clues probably in the back of the book, but nobody's looking for them the right way. Like that, that call that two column structure from the back of the book. That's weird. There's a very specific, um, structure to the format. Like you said, the two columns, and that seems strange. So why, why is that structured that way? Oh, I want to know the answer to that one because it is very confusing. We, we just told you the answer to that one, Seats. I would take one word and add it to another word, and you get one big word, then it's over here, it's over there. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. But okay, so let's bring, let's bring it back, back around. Let's talk about Cleveland, right? Because um, I know if I bring up Chicago, we're just going to talk about the Chicago World's Ferry for four hours. Let's talk about Cleveland. How does, Cle how does the back of the book help us in Cleveland? I don't think it has to help you. Because I I just don't Me think neither. Cleveland's part Wait, of it. Nice. We agree. I don't think it the back of the No, book I, I think the back of the book is specific to New York, Houston, and Canada. That's it. I don't think I You think three quarters of this book is focused on helping you in New York and Canada and, and where else? Where where else was it? I think it's making you realize it's not in Dallas. It's in Houston. It's making you realize it's not St. Louis, you know, that it's, you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, I think it's just for the ones that are like really hard. I don't think Cleveland has anything to do with the back of the book. So something tells me Carly, Car Carly's going to disagree with this. Carly, do you oh, have yeah. a thought I'll, about Cleveland? I'll disagree completely. Oh yeah. Yay. So Cleveland, I got a couple things right off the top here. <laughs> so the, the post, -mo post monster gen you know there's a centaur in the picture right and it talks about the centaur in reverse in the post monster general and we know that the tower is upside down we know that they were on the wrong side when they were searching for it um so that could have been a, a potential clue that they needed to change sides and reverse sides through the, the center from one column to the other um you know, just a little subtle thing like that could have been enough to put them on the right track there. And then the other one is the calculus uh, with this mention of um, Euclid 
and Euclidean geometry is based on plane geometry, and there's a triangle right there in the image. Um, so I, I think a lot of that in the in the calculus is hinting towards the use of math. And if you look at that entire verse, it's giving you a grid um, that you got to work from front to back, right to left, top to bottom to pinpoint the spot. And, and so that's all plane geometry right there. So, I mean, I, I kind of think that um, there are things in there if you're if you're like I said, if you're reading between the lines. OK, so let me go back to the postmaster general because the other uh, you basically lost me. OK, uh, so you're talking about where it says the citizens of his native Rome believe the postmaster general to be a sort of centaur in reverse, a creature with the hindquarters of a horse for a head. The, the hindquarters of a yeah the hindquarters of a horse for a head atop a pair of all too human flat feet right so it's saying it's a reverse centaur right that instead of a yeah okay so how and just because it's saying it's a reverse centaur we're supposed to apply that to Cleveland because Cleveland has the centaur in the image right that's what well, you're saying doesn't it also yeah. say how how he made his way from Italy well I think there's also things in the image that are reversed right. Well, the, the the terminal tower is upside down. The terminal tower is upside down. That's it. Well, I guess the uh, the numbers the, for the latitude and longitude are reversed. So yeah, that goes with what you're those saying. are reversed. I, I think if you look at the actual map, the map around the area of the, of the cask where it was found, um, the Shakespeare Drive creates a small triangle that's basically flip flopped opposite. If um, you were looking at it as a map. Um, I think there's a lot of things that, that it kind of talks to just by reversing things through the sort of the center point of the jewel in the image. How do you flip a triangle? So was it found between like the Greek and the, and the Italian garden? Wasn't it those two? Uh, it was in the Greek gardens next to the Italian gardens. And I don't remember. What okay. Cause it says how he made his way from Italy to these shores remains a mystery. I mean, is that a clue? I don't know. But you go from Italy to Greece right there in that part of the garden. Well, you never actually have to go into the Italian garden whatsoever for that puzzle. No. Yeah. Oh, it's in the oh, middle of the Italian. Oh, you're not walking between and... those signs? No. It's in the, it's in the okay. uh, middle of the Italian and the Lithuanian gardens. Okay. What is? The Greek cultural gardens. Oh, It's yes. actually, it's in the center of the Italian, the Ukraine, and the Lithuanian. Well, it's, it's the Italian, then it's the Greek, and then there's some other down the road. Lithuanian. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, okay. I'll give it to you. I mean, it talks about a centaur. There's a centaur in the image. It talks about a reverse centaur. Sure. What about Boston? What do we got for Boston? Oh, Boston, there's a 10. So first, I would say the beginning of the book, Prep School, is definitely for Boston. It's, it's Boston and New York, in my opinion, because it's talking about the Ivy League. And so there's some, there's some references to the Ivy League that, that gets you to the general area. And I think the, the biggest one from the prep school actually comes from the images, the illustrations in there. The, the pictures of him standing there, he's always, the ones that have stairs in them, he has his back to the stairs in the image where he's standing in front of um, the girl and also on the next page, the image where he's kind of facing down the stairs, you know, that would be almost as if he was coming down the cop cell terrace, for example, you're coming down the stairs there. Um, I think the other thing from that p picture with the, with the woman is look at her leg and how she's got her toe lifted, I'm sorry, her heel lifted, and her toe is pointing straight down. And so just look at her leg from the knee down, the one that's that's bent, and then compare that to the leg in the painting for Boston, the, the leg that is right next to the edge of home plate in the image. And it is basically the same shape of leg, just flip-flopped. I mean, a leg is a leg. Um, I fun fact, the exact same thing. That's that's Ben Ason's wife. That's his that's his wife's leg. Just you know, she had very nice legs. Yes, he he <laughs> said so, and we're it's cool for us to say that because Ben said it first. I mean, right. I mean, I mean, it, Br Bradley Bradley agrees, and I I mean, a leg's a leg. And what I'm I think what I'm getting at is, if Boston were not solved, this helps us in no way. 
It just doesn't help us. We would have never made that connection. No one made that connection before Boston was solved. It was afterwards. Right. But how great that we're using it to look at things. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. If we could find some stuff in like the Bible that relates to the secret, that'd be great, too. But it doesn't mean it's a clue. It just means that we're finding things that are kind of similar. So I think I think that's a stretch to argue. I mean, we're talking about things in the same book here. You know what I mean? right? It's a, it's a big book. It's a lot of words. It's a lot of pictures. There's a lot of things that we could find where it's like, you know, the, this verse talks about stairs and there's stairs in this image. I don't know. I, I don't know how often they, they use stairs. I, I got a couple more. If you want to, if yeah, you want to go down going. to yeah. some other fairies, the, uh, the household unfamiliar, I would say is probably one of the, the best examples of it because it, it kind of ties into what we were just kind of going into there. Um, you know, it, it basically says that, you know, he, let me find the spot here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm pretty sure this is Byron's fridge, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was. It was Byron's fridge. So the, speaking of the refrigerator, okay, all these pranks and more are the work of the household unfamiliar, but his special province is the refrigerator. Where he moves as soon as you start to feel at home. So we get a dress and it's talking about movement, right? And so on the next page, actually at the bottom of that page and the next page, there's a picture of him in the refrigerator. Uh -huh. And in both of those pictures, he's taking a step. And so I know a lot of people out there believe that it was five steps from home plate. I'm not one of them. I think it was one step. I think that, I think the image um, shows that, and I think that this coincides with the image in that it's a single step from home plate. I think the leg from the prep school shows the direction off of home plate, and I think when you combine those two things, it would have given you the exact dig spot. But that completely contradicts the verse. And the verse tells you to take five steps. No, it tells you to take five steps. Not only does it completely contradict the verse, it completely contradicts the surveyor who said this is where the cask was. This is where the hole was, where we dug the cask. So if that's true, both the verse and the surveyor are lying to you. Well, Bradley, I, I, I honestly think that all this is battle of the assumptions, man. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all just, you know, this is why I believe and this is why I believe you're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're right kind of thing. You know what I mean? Whatever it takes for somebody to be able to actually find a cask, better off for you. you yeah. Know, best no, I mean, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And if you want to use the back of the book, then, then by all means, feel free. But I maintain that this has told us nothing new. Nothing. Now, George, George, it, I if I'm remembering correctly, George, yep. when we were, when I, the wife and I was watching Expedition or EU, however you want to say it, when Jason and Jason Krupp, I think that's how you say his last name. And, JG, as I like to call him, we're walking. JG turned to Jason and asked him, how did you find this? Jason responded, by what I read in the back of the book. Now, I'm not that familiar with Boston or the back of the book that pertains to Boston, but something in the back of the book he read put him towards that location. We can go find out real quick. That's yeah. yeah. I will say this uh, while he's uh, checking that out. I, I like Jason Krupat's personality. He's a cool dude. I love that his family got involved. I love that episode that they put together. I agree with very little of his solve. So, um, I mean, yeah, it got him there, and kudos to him. He's the one mm -hmm. that uh, got credit for it. But um, I would not use him as a solidifying reference as he said this, so it's a good argument for why this is true. He does have the jewel, though, Bradley. He does have the jewel. He does have a jewel. You're 100 percent right. He has uh, parts of a cask. He's got parts of a key. He's got parts of a lid. So kudos to him. I'd take it. Yeah, especially when an excavator found it. Right. <laughs> he didn't even have to dig in poison ivy. <laughs> he didn't have to do nothing. Poor guy. Hey, did you ever get that looked at? Yeah, man. I got a, um, a steroid prescription from my doctor. It's uh, pretty oh, nasty. It's like all over me. That stuff itches, doesn't it? It like it's so crazy. spreads so fast. So so yeah. for those that don't know what we're talking about, we're killing time here. But um, about a week ago, I was digging and I started finding some interesting things. So I just started going hands on and I was just digging with my hands in the dirt. 
I found a bunch of bricks. I found some old uh, metal pipes. I found a really old marble, which was really cool. Um, I found some old like um, tubes, like like a tube of toothpaste type stuff. I found um, an old uh, shoe sole, an old leather shoe sole, and some other neat things. And um, the whole time I was doing this, my wife was like, uh, "There's poison ivy or poison oak over there. Just be careful." I was like, "Well, it's over there. I'm not even touching the leaves." Well, I had no idea you can get that stuff from the root systems, and I was definitely tearing out roots. So um, about a few days later, my hand started swelling and started blistering, and then my arm, then my legs, then my face, and, and it is nasty. So if you're digging, wear gloves because uh, I did not know, but you can get that stuff through the root systems. I'm still fighting it. How, how far down your body did you get it? I got it from head to toe. Oh, head to toe, huh? Oh, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere except for the the two places you really don't want it to be. Don't lie to me, Bradley. This is the best part. Even if you've got to exaggerate a little bit, just let us know. Is it on the tip? Uh, (laughs) Wait, did you say the tip or the tit? The tip, baby. Uh, All about the tip. I I have it on the tit, but not the tip. So just to cut this awesome conversation short, I did look and I think (laughs) seeds, I think, I think what you're talking about is when Josh Gates asked Jason, uh, what painting he used. He said this one, the one on the front of the book. I'm going to go look. Stand by. All right. You go look. It's on 12 treasures.com in the media section under episode three. Uh, so my favorite uh, crew pack quote from that was whenever they're outside the ballpark. And he's like, well, uh, it's got signs saying you can't get in there. And Crew Pat's like, yeah, that was a problem. <laughs> I want to piggyback on my last comment. Um, not, nobody's brought anything to me that's new. Nobody's brought anything that's, help, that's helpful to me. Um, Carly, what is your most convincing? What, what do you think is most convincing that's new? What do you think that you've found in the back of the book that will help somebody that, you know, for a puzzle that we've never, we haven't solved? My my whole thing is I've always posted stuff that I think helps solve the newer ones, the ones that haven't been solved. Yeah. And the the pushback that I always get is, well, there's nothing in there that would have helped any of the ones that have already been solved. So that that's when I changed my focus and I started looking at the the puzzles that have been solved, trying to find things in there. And you're right, there 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 isn't anything that I've given you that would help you anything new. But if you didn't know anything about Austin and you saw that the, he was taking a, a, a step or that feel at home maybe was an important thing because it stood out, that could potentially help you. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of tough to say what would help somebody that um, hasn't seen anything. But, I mean, I can give you a, a great example out of the Chicago World earlier if you want to talk about Chicago for a minute. So in the Chicago World's Ferry, it, it starts off with a, a reference where it's in the very first paragraph under the range, uh, it says hog butcher, tool maker, and stacker of wheat. Um, that's a poem by, uh, called Chicago by, by Carl Sandburg. And if you look up that author, he has three Pulitzer, surprise, uh, Pulitzer Prizes. Yeah. Two of them are for his poetry. And the third one is for his um, book on Abraham Lincoln. And so being in Chicago, I think that's, a way that you can um, kind of infer something f- about the, the Chicago puzzle. Then it talks about um, wh- what he's surrounded by. And so it says that, you know, he's got barren windswept plains surrounding him on three sides. So he snuggles up against Lake Michigan for warmth. And we all know that uh, Grant Park is literally, literally right up against the lake. Um, it also says that he's surrounded by impossible fields um, soldiers, Wrigley, Marshall, and O'Hare. And this is something I, I just found out the other day. So if you're on Google Earth at home, pull up Chicago and plug in a, a, a point for Wrigley Field, right at the front of the, of the baseball field where the sign is, the famous sign. And then Marshall Fields was a famous um, store that the Macy's building is in now. So you'd have to, uh, to Google the address on that one. And then Soldier Field is where the Bears play. And put all three of those points in, into your map. And then draw a line Wrigley Field to Soldier Field. And you'll see that it goes right through Marshall Field store. All three of those are in a direct line to each other. And the interesting thing is, 
Also on that line is the entrance to Grant Park and the Bowman statue. So that's something directly from the text that if you were to plot these positions on a map could have led you directly to the entrance of the park, to the Bowman statue, um, and then you see Carl Sandburg reference, you know, with the, the Abraham Lincoln autobiography, then, then uh, would have had something. Okay. So the back of the book is telling you, look for these things that we've already put in the painting or look for these things that we've already put in the verse. Like it, it, like the things that you're finding, th that's not new. It's, it's not, it's not even really something that I would consider a confirmer. I mean, it's just like, it's words that are sort of related to the verse and draw, drawing a line. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's good, I guess uh, it's good, but I, I just don't know. Like it's tricky. Remember what I said at the beginning about what I believe? I mean, I believe that the answers are in the back. So if the clue is, you know, over his shoulder, but you don't know who he is, then the answer is in the back. If you do your research, you'll figure out it's Lincoln. Right. But if you follow, so, the verse, I mean, that's you, how I think they connect. Or you could just follow the verse and know who L is. Like if you don't follow the verse, you don't know who M and B is. That's not in the back of the book either. You have to follow the verse to know. And the verse George, tells if, I could, if I could interject for just a second, what you're saying is absolutely correct, but why does that make the back of the book incorrect? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yes, you can do that, but why does it mean you can't do this too? Because I mean, Byron said, like, the back of the book doesn't matter. He, that's what he said. Like, I, I just, it's what okay, he said. But, but it, he didn't say that you can't use it to help you. Yeah, so I'm I'm liking some of the logic Carly's coming up with. I don't uh, the line thing, uh, okay, but um, I like the um, the the references that you're coming up with, and uh, I didn't put two and two together with the, with what you just talked about with Chicago. So I, I like that information. Um, so yeah, again, I, I and I know I said at the beginning the images have confirmers, but okay, cool. Uh, I like this for um, confirmers in the text as well for certain things. I could see that that could seem helpful, not needed, but absolutely helpful. I think that's where I am with all of this is it's not, it's not a hundred percent necessary at all, but I mean, Hey, it's there. So my thing is if we take the back of the book and we take these five or 10 or 20 or whatever things that we're deciding are clues out of this or hundred and whatever pages, what's to stop us from taking red herrings? What's the, how do we know? How do we know what's a clue and what's not? How do we know that Naga hides a clue or how do we know that, you know, I mean, Chicago World's Ferry, I get it. It's about Chicago, whatever. But how do we know that these things are clues and, and something random isn't? Okay, so George had asked, is there anything new that I could bring that would possibly solve something else? And if anybody has ever seen my New York solution, you know, I basically end up at Roosevelt Island and I use the, the Queensboro Bridge and the St. Nicholas Cathedral and I create on the map, a tr uh, basically an angle. And then that leads me out to Astoria Park. And what's in interesting about the points that I just um, gave you in Chicago is there was also O'Hare, which is out to the east, sorry, to the west. And then there was also three mentions of the fires that were in Chicago. There was 1893 at the Columbian Exposition. 1934, which was the, um, the, which one was that? That was the stockyard fire. And then in 1968, he was basically making fun of the democratic convention, which was a dumpster fire. So when you plug in those positions on the map, along with the, the three I added before, and you're going to use O'Hare airport, you're going to use the international amphitheater, which is where the democratic convention was. And you're going to use Jackson Park, where the Columbian Exposition was. You're going to see that from Wrigley Field through the Marshall Field store, through Soldier Field, so Soldier Field, and all the way down to Jackson Park is a, an exactly a straight line. And then from Jackson Park, you're going to go through the International Amphitheater, and it will take you directly to O'Hare. And it creates a very large angle. Here's what's interesting about how that ties into New York. 
So the Chicago World's Ferry, its scientific name up at the top is Herbs Secunda, which is second city. In the very first line in the range, it talks about it has a titanic inferiority complex. <laughs> That's because it's been compared to New York. Yep. And the poem Chicago by Carl Sandburg was basically him describe, describing it as a chant of defiance against New York. And so if all of these things are pointing to New York and you get this giant triangle, it has the exact same ratios and dimensions as the triangle that I created at Roosevelt Island. And so when I see stuff like that, I just don't think it's a coincidence. All right. I'll post that in the group once this goes up. And that, that would be something new. That would hopefully lead you to the cask in New York. Oh, gosh. I just, what I really want to do, I, I really, like, I feel like car, I, my goal in this, and, and it, having no structure sucks, I know, but my goal in this is giving Carly a fair shake because I feel like Carly gets a lot of shit. So really, I just want to get as much stuff out as Carly wants to talk about. So Carly, whatever you want to talk about, lead us into it and we'll go down it. I just want you to be able to have a time when you can get all of this out there in a way that people understand if that makes sense. So wherever you want to go, don't wait for us to just take, just take us there, man. We're on your school bus. Drive us. Yeah. Yeah. Drive. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is how certain fairies have references in them that can be a hint to how we should approach solving the puzzles. So for example, in the pilgrim, it has a dictionary definition of the word pill and then the word grim being a goblin's name from the Encyclopedia of Fairies. Those are two reference books that I think are important to us solving this thing. And he threw them in there early in the book so that we would have an idea. Hey, you might want to pull out your dictionary so that you can look up words. Um, you might want to have this book, the Encyclopedia of Fairies, so you can understand what some of these fairies are all about. Um, I think there's a there's a, a lot of little things like that hidden in there. I'll give you another example. Um, in the Post Monster General and the Leprechaun Man, they both have zip codes listed in there. And we know from the Boston Solve that, that the zip code was pretty important. And, and then uh, one other one is the, the nomenclature. Um, it talks a lot about, you know, synonyms and euphemisms and double entendres, reading between the lines, uh, which is also mentioned in the, the Pentagorgon. So I think all of those kind of things are just ways that it's trying to tell us, hey, pay attention to these things as you're reading through all these fairies. The other, the other one that pops up a lot is the word abroad and aboard. And I think that he kind of messes with that word. And I know that, you know, some of the, the reference materials with, you know, the, the, one, the one book that has a few of the different references in it, uh, Abroad in America or whatever it was called. Yeah. Hi, buddy. I think that was maybe what he was trying to, to get us, lead, lead us to there. I want to talk about, I'd like to, I'd like to know, like, if you're, if you're starting out with this and everything, if you're new to the search and if you want to, you know, kind of figure out, where your fair people belong and like, you know, you start out the litany of jewels. That's how I did it. I went from the litany of jewels and I found out my, uh, fair person's origin from there. And also from litany of jewels, I figured out which painting goes to which immigration, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a good starting point for everybody. Um, the, the, the key thing that, uh, was discovered that I think, uh, got everybody on the right track was the fact that there is some sort of way to get a one through 12 out of each painting, connect that to the litany of jewels. And then there's your biggest starting point. Yeah. I mean, I think so what you were saying, man, new people, um, I think new people would have the easiest time finding things in the back of the book, because like, if you're just jumping into, if you just bought the book and you had never heard podcasts and you never joined the Facebook pages, you never saw EU there's no hindrance for Hughes in the back of the book. You see what I'm saying? Like over the, over the past 20 years or whatever, there's been a big hindrance online. People saying the back of the book doesn't matter. The back of the book doesn't matter. So if anybody's going to find any sort of connection to the back of the book, it's going to be a new person, somebody without that sort of hindrance. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a thought. I'm just, I I'm, 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 One of the uh, things that I've kind of thought about, just to tag along with what Seeds was saying, you know, I've looked through all these ferries and tried to figure out their immigration tie-in. And I think that the things you got to be careful with is just because something ties into a certain immigration group doesn't necessarily mean that it ties in to that particular puzzle that we know the immigration theme matches with. And I'll give you an example. If you find a Greek reference and you think, well, that has to mean that this is a clue for Cleveland. Well, you also have to remember that Boston's verse has a Greek reference directly in the verse. So yes. it's possible that 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 Greek reference that you found could be a clue for Boston and it could be referencing Xenophon and Thucydides. Yeah. That's, that's, so that's, it's just important that, to kind of keep some of those things in mind. It just like in, in like the backyard barber creep, right? The, uh, the barber creeps ancestors were horned and furry hutch satyrs or whatever of ancient Greece who unwillingly used to, used to participate in many a goat roast in Arcady today, whatever. So how do we know that because that's talking about, you know, Greek, characters coming or people coming from greece how do we know that that's not um talking about cleveland i think you'd have to do some trial and error on some of these right i mean just like as you're trying to solve the verse you're going to have solves that that don't work and you're going to go back to the drawing board i, I think as you kind of go through the back of the book if you find something you're going to see if it fits in, into whatever solution you're working on and if it doesn't then maybe you got to look at a different direction um another one is the rich doctor, um, you know, we know that there's a witch in the painting for Boston and the rich doctor is a play on words for the witch doctor. Yeah. And so right there you get a little bit of a tie in with the witch theme and in the rich doctor, there's a talk, there's a section where it talks about Attic Greece, you know, which is, you know, the ancient Greece. And, and, um, that's right when Xenophon and Thucydides were doing their thing. Um, so, you know, you would have to make a decision on, is this referring to Cleveland or is this referring to Boston? But you're saying like, it's, it's really just a trial and error thing. There's no way in this method of using the back of the book to know something's true. I mean, because the verse tells you, the verse tells you when something's true, right? You go from point A to point B. If point B doesn't match up, point A was wrong. You see what I'm saying? But there's no there's no method like that in the back of the book at all. I don't think there's a formula, especially like, you know, for example, I'm looking at unreal estate brokers and under the picture, it talks about them, you know, being between Catalina and Hawaii. Well, we know there's no cask in either of those places. So I feel like, you know, that's a lot of red herrings is like throwing in, you know, cities and states like that. So I don't I don't know that there's a formula that makes this no better than a guess. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're just guessing. You, you want to hear something really interesting on what you just brought up? Mm -hmm. So if you plug in Florida and Hawaii, just into your Google or just, just search Florida, it's going to give you a, a dot right in the middle of it. Run a line between those two. And you're going to see that that line goes right through Houston. Yeah, but it, it goes right through a lot of other cities too. If you do that throughout the entire book, you're going to start to see lines that are going to go in areas over cities that have casks. Yeah. And if you follow the Lincoln highway, you're going to go through a bunch of cast cities. Hell, if you just drive down the interstate, you're going to go through all the cast cities. That doesn't necessarily mean that either of them have to do with the puzzle. Furthermore, in 1982, you couldn't just Google Florida on Google maps and have it plop you right down in the center of a city. You can't map things that way. I mean, like these, these lines that you're creating using Google Earth this way don't make any sense in 1982. But let's say for pretend that they do. Let's say for pretend that in 1982 you could pop on your computer, you could boot up Google Earth or whatever, you could type in Florida, it would drop you on a map, you create your line, whatever. It, the line runs right through Houston. What makes Houston so special, right? Why are we stopping at Houston? Why not continue on to the next city or the city after that or the city after that or the city before Houston even or four cities before Houston. What's to say we're not looking in Florida? Why not stop at one of the Florida cities? What's causing us to stop? 
What's causing us to stop is the fact that we already know the answer. We didn't need this to get there. So if you took all the references, I've done this, by the way, okay. you take all the references of cities or places that you can pinpoint through, there's probably about 13 or 14 of the ferries that have specific points that you could put down and you start plotting them out, you'll see that there'll be lines that go directly through places and it just, I think overall, if you were back in 1982 and you had your map and you started doing this, you would start to see that, man, there's a lot of lines that are going through this area. What's in this area? Oh, there's a lot of lines that go through this area up here. Why is this area so important? Draw your lines. Everybody draw your lines. Yes, everybody open your map to page seven. I left my protractor at home. Yeah. This is the, the problem that I thought I was going to get into in this episode because it's hard. Like we just sort of have to take that at face value and there's not really a way we can argue it because we can't see it. I'll, I'll post all these after this episode comes out. Um, another one that's real easy is the Mater Demon. It talks about Monticello being there with Jefferson and then moving north to the Capitol which is Washington, D.C. Uh, if you run a line through Washington, D.C. from Monticello, it goes straight to the Verrazano Bridge, right to New York, the entrance to the, to the harbor. There's all kinds of things like that in the field guide. But if I was looking at this, if I was looking at this back in 1980, before post-internet there, I would never have thought about drawing a line directly down, directly across, or anything like that. I mean, I wouldn't have. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I think, I think some people would, though. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's just a way, uh, you know, especially with a lot of the puzzles that were around then, you, you did that. You had, you know, you had your compass and your map and your ruler, and, and that's, you know, so why not experiment with it, right? But I don't know in 1982 how I'm going to put a map, uh, how I'm going to put a dot on a map in Washington, D.C. and a dot in the map anywhere else and know that that line points directly to a bridge. Right, I, I can't get a map that big that shows me where a bridge is. So I think what we've established at this point is that we all agree that there are things in the back of the book that can be confirmers, but what is yet to be proven, and if there's a format in which the uh, information in the back of the book can be directly applied uh, to the puzzles as not a confirmer necessarily, but a, a tool to help you solve the puzzles. Um, and none of us know how that can how that could work. And Carly's presented some wonderful ideas, um, uh, but no no workable, repeatable format as to how to apply these ideas to the other puzzles, which I think is what we're all looking for now at this point. Yeah, and I I mean I still I I still like even given all this I still don't necessarily buy it. There's a lot in the back of this book, and we're just picking and choosing. We're picking and choosing little things, and we're saying this is this is a clue because it's similar. Um, or because it leads us to where we already know we're going. But there's a lot in the back of this book we're just not looking at that would lead us to other places. So let me let me read this. Um, this is something I can't hold against anybody for not having because it didn't come out until like an hour ago or, you know, yesterday, whatever. Um, the back of the book... Let me just read this to you. There's a couple of pages in the Japanese book that aren't in the English book. Um, and the pages, they're called, what about the descendants? So I'm just going to read what about the descendants to you. It's written entirely in Japanese. Nobody knew what it said until it was recently translated. And, and a, a note about the, the Japanese book. Um, we, we've got a, a person who doesn't want to be, um, public yet, who's been working with the original translator who translated Byron's words into Japanese for this book, who translated the entire book into Japanese. has been working with them to get as accurate as a, a, of a recreation of the Japanese book in English as possible. Like every page that he retranslates back to English, he has to send to the original translator and have them approved. He has to pay money to do this. Uh, just to make them as accurate as possible. And there are some things in the back of, in, in the Japanese hints section, especially that we've gotten completely wrong. Um, like uh, Lane on Montreal, it's wrong. The Japanese hint is just flat out wrong. Um, and hopefully soon, once everything's approved, it'll, it'll lead a little more, it'll give a little more clarity um, to what's going on back there. Anyway, 
two pages in the Japanese book that never been translated that aren't in the English book. They're called What About the Descendants? And it goes like this. This is roughly translated, by the way. So uh, the English is a little funky. Sorry. Uh, what about the descendants? The various fair people introduced in this book were descendants of fairies migrated from European country to avoid humans. Therefore, they had nothing to do with the traditional orthodox fairy tales commonly told in Europe. They are created by the book's original authors for the purpose of a game. The game, I'm sorry, they are created by the book's original authors and editor for the purpose of the game. The game, I suppose, as you read throughout the book, each was written humorously with playful spirits as, as each represented different criticism of a nowadays society. The sharpness was impressive. I, I wonder who the author was. I was convinced the two authors, Sean Kedd and Ted Mann, were both editors of the National Lampoon, a very popular monthly American humor magazine. As many of readers here might not be familiar with the authors and the National Lampoon magazine, here's a brief introduction of the magazine. The National Lampoon was first published in 1970, yes, an era when American college students had the sharpest consciousness. Its mother magazine, Harvard Lampoon, was started by graduates of Harvard University. By the way, the word lampoon means a sharp, often vitriolent satire against an individual or society, uh, a satire literature, a sarcasm, ironic culture, etc. The magazine was created in such an era, it represents a strong criticism rather than visual appeal like comics. The magazine was known for its short stories with catchy typefaces and various forms of humor as its weapon. In other words, instead of rushing a hit with a, with a rigid head, they, they, they separated the attack into various themes by different artists to form recognitions. It's, it's sarcastically entertaining. In Fairy's Field Guide, the latter half of the book, a strong lampoon style was, was cultivated by the editors of the magazine, demonstrated throughout the book. However, we have a problem here. Because the target audience were mainly readers of North America, when it was read by someone not familiar with American culture and current situations, let alone laugh, these are things most people couldn't even understand. In this regard, even for the readers here in the United States, a lot of things here in this book, not all readers are able to laugh or either under even understand. Mr. Price said so himself. That includes me, the translator, and all the staff in the editorial department of, of Fatami Shobo. We're all scratching our heads. We even thought about noting the jokes and satires, but then the notes would be longer than the story. Therefore, the editor, which would be Byron, uh, decided that we should rewrite the content of the book. Even though, of course, nobody should re rewrite it haphazardly. As a result, after various thoughts and considerations, so based on each fairy's given name and their individual story, the general story was rewritten. Even though I'm not very familiar with American general culture, it was rewritten to better fit readers in, in, Je in Japan. Therefore, most of the contents of the fairy's field guide, strictly speaking, wasn't really a translation. After all, the staff and the editor all suggested a rewrite over translations. All of the staffs agreed a simple, readable story that readers could enjoy was far better than something no one understands. Last but not least, I wanted to thank Shozo Ikeda and Shindo Marakata and, and, and the editor's department for, for, for Tommy for publishing this book. I'd like to take the opportunity to express my sincere gratitude. What we take from this is Byron thought the back of the book was so like it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to the hunt. It didn't matter enough to even get, a sort of rewrite. It didn't get any editor's notes from him. It didn't get anything. They completely rewrote it in a completely different story. Nothing from the English version is in the Japanese version. And if Byron loved this Does puzzle, that include pictures? Well, some of the pictures, some of the pictures, some of the pictures are there, but then there are some additional pictures and they're they're done by another artist who um, we, we found the artist. We know they're his work. They have nothing to do with the secret. He, they were just sort of like clip art. I'm just saying for the general podcast audience, we're not going to release his name because we don't want people to bother him. Um, you're just going to have you have to take our word for it. We found him. Uh, he's one of our friends on Facebook. He's a good dude. Um, he just wants to be left alone. He has nothing to do with this book. The, the little clip art illustrations, nothing to do with the book. No hints. The back of the book in Japanese is completely different from the back of the book in, in English. It's it's just Byron didn't think the back of the book was important enough to even think about. All right. So, boys, what do you think about that? What do you think about? 
Like, I mean, like general thoughts, Seeds and Carly, what do you think about that? You only need one poem, one painting. <laughs> I'm I'm serious. I'm sorry, but I, I, I've been researching this. I've been researching this for the last week. I've been working 14, 15 hour days coming home, just hitting this so hard. And I was so excited about the progress I made with my friends, Nick and Caroline on it. But to me, it basically just gave me a play, a, a, the state and the city, but nothing else. And if I didn't have that, I can still figure it out. Well, not figure it out because I haven't found one with just one painting, one poem. So to me, the three quarters of the book, just if you didn't have it, I don't think it'd matter. I mean, it's a it's a valid argument to make. The book says all you need is a painting in a verse. Byron told reporters all you needed was a painting in a verse. Byron told reporters the back of the book didn't matter. Byron cared so much about the back of the book that he didn't even care if it was translated in Japanese. You take all of these facts together, and until we have some sort of concrete evidence from the back of the book that can't be denied, that leads to something new, that leads to a cask, you have to believe the creator. I'm sorry. I mean, in my opinion, the evidence is overwhelming. There's nothing helpful in the text of the back of the book. 